Good morning. Reading from Genesis 14, verses 14 to 16. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. During the night, Abram divided his men to attack them, and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Huba, north of Damascus. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions together with the women and the other people. Morning, church. Really glad you guys are here. Uh, Shamus mentioned that that we are going to be doing another trip to Mohi, Nairobi, Kenya uh, this next year, June 2025. And uh, my family and I uh, are going to be attending that trip again. My wife, Natalie, and I are actually going to be leading that trip again. And so if you were to come to the October 6th uh, informational meeting, uh, you you get to hang out with us. And um, we we would love to tell you more about that trip and more about what's going on uh, in Kenya. Uh, we're, We're we're titling that informational meeting Mohi in 15. Uh, because it's right after both services, we're going to do our best to tell you everything you need to know about that trip in 15 minutes. And I see that going 15 minutes just as much as my sermons are under 30 minutes. So, um, but in all seriousness, it, it is going to be a good time, and I, I can't t- talk enough about um, w- what an incredible trip that is. I've been on lots of mission trips. It's it's unlike most any other mission trip I've been on. There's some really special things happening in Kenya, and it, it, it's a really fun trip. It's a really impactful trip. It can be a super exhausting and physically demanding trip, but but it, it's a worthwhile conversation. So if you're remotely curious, um, we would love to invite you to come that day, hear more. Uh, about that trip. Uh, last week, uh, we, we kicked off a brand new series uh, called Tithe um, that's all about the, the biblical practice of giving that we've come to know as tithing. The, the word tithe means 10. It, it, it's the concept of giving 10% of what you have back to God. And I just want to say, like, one week into this series, I, I'm very, very proud of our church. As we said last week when we kicked this thing off, like, these are series where, where you know, you you feel the discomfort in the room. We don't like to talk about money. Like as human beings, it's not something we enjoy talking about. When you, you talk to other pastors around the country and you say, oh, I'm going to do a giving series, they're like, oh, enjoy your attendance going down for however long that is. Um, and so uh, I'm grateful you came back today. Um, well done. Um, but but in all seriousness, I am proud of our church. Had some really good conversations this past week in which people asked some very, very good questions. It's obvious that God is stirring in lots of people's hearts. Uh, we made budget this past week, which was exciting. So there's, there's some response happening. And so love to see that. We're, we're going to continue on in this series today. I, I kind of gave you trajectory last week of where we're going. And this week we're going to talk about where does this idea come from? Um, this, this idea is a long-standing idea. We're actually going to look exclusively at the Old Testament today, which can be a little intimidating. Usually Old Testament can be a little confusing. We're talking about people who lived a very, very long time ago in very different cultures than what we experience today. And, and so there can be some context issues, things like that. We're going to move slowly. We're, we're going to try to keep things very, very practical, very, very straightforward. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at two different passages in the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 14, Deuteronomy 14. We're going to make three observations about each. And so if you're following along on the app, if you have a Bible, those are the only two passages we're going to be in. And so it should be, should be relatively easy to follow along today. We're going to start in Genesis 14. Because uh, in Genesis 14, we're, we're introduced to the concept of tithing. Okay? Uh, and so it's, it's a concept by Deuteronomy 14, which is, which is somewhere around 
430 to just under 450 years later, uh, it's something that God expresses as a command. So it goes, undergoes a lot of changes in that amount of time. But in Genesis 14, we're, we're introduced to the concept, and it shows up in the life of this guy, Abram. Now, if that name sounds familiar, it's probably because you're familiar with Abraham. Same guy. Uh, at this point, he's going by Abram. Later, uh, God gives him the name Abraham. This, this is a significant figure in the Old Testament. If you're not familiar with the Old Testament at all, he's, he's one of the big ones. He received a, a promise from the Lord. He received a prophecy spoken over his life that God was going to form a nation through him. And that would ultimately become God's people. Um, God would bless this nation. This nation would extend that blessing to the entire world. So if you're somebody who lives primarily in the New Testament, when you read about the church, this is the very beginning of that concept, was, was this blessing, this prophecy of this nation that God would grow up. God wanted to be close to a people. Sin had separated people from God. This is how God was going to restore that closeness through this promise to Abraham. Abraham. But, but this particular situation, it's kind of a, a zoomed in moment in Abram's life where his nephew Lot has gotten caught up in this big old mess with this kind of tyrant king called Ketelamar. Ketelamar has, has allied himself with these other terrible kings and they're just wreaking havoc on this particular region. And so there's a few kings in that region who, who are leading kind of smaller empires who decide, you know, enough's enough. We're going to stand up to these guys. And so they march out, they, they get united and they say, we're going to, we're going to fight back. Well, Kettle Lamar, I mean, he's, he's a big, bad dude. He's got a big, bad army. They just completely overwhelm these kings. These kings go running for their lives. A lot of their people fall into tar pits. And so uh, Kettle Lamar kind of swoops in and, and he just, this one particular empire called Sodom, he just takes everything. He takes all the people. He takes all the stuff. Lot, who is living in the Sodom area at a time, he just kind of gets scooped up in that. And so Abram hears about this and, and Larry read, this passage where Abram just decides, you know, like, I, I don't have a dog in this fight, but that's my nephew. I'm going to go get him. And, and so he, raised, he he grabs 315 dudes that live within his household um, who, who are just described as trained. And obviously they're trained really, really well because they go and, and they, they get everything back. They, they, they take out all Kettle Lamar's men. They get everything back and, and they come marching back. Like if they turn this into a movie, obviously Liam Neeson is playing Abram. Like it's, it's a super super cool story, like, like super intense. And it's when he comes back triumphantly, he's got his nephew, but he's got all this stuff that was stolen from, from, from Sodom, people, goods, like all this stuff, this really interesting situation presents itself. And this is where we first encounter the concept of a tithe. So I'm going to read you the whole thing, and then we're going to make three observations from this passage. So Here's, here's how it goes in Genesis chapter 14, starting verse 17. After Abram returned from defeating Ketelamar and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him. So Sodom's where everything was stolen from. King of Sodom comes out to meet him in the valley of Shiva. That, that is the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, we haven't met him yet, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high, and he blessed Abram saying, blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God most high who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him, Melchizedek, a tenth of everything. So there it is, first inception of the tithe, gives it to Melchizedek. The king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, with raised hand, I have sworn an oath to the Lord, God most high, creator of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the strap of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. Like we've said, Old Testament, it, it can be confusing at times. This is a pretty straightforward story, but let me just give us a quick kind of synopsis of what just happened. So Abram comes back triumphantly. They've conquered Ketel Lamar. They've reclaimed all the stuff that was taken, people and goods. Lot is safe and secure. Comes back, two kings come out to meet him. One is the king of Sodom, where everything was stolen from. The other is this, this mysterious king of Salem. Uh, his name's Melchizedek. He's described as a priest of God most high. Melchizedek speaks up first, speaks a blessing over Abram. 
Abram receives the blessing. And then the king of Sodom speaks up and says, listen, I'll cut you a deal. Give me back my people. You keep all the stuff as a reward. Abram rejects this offer and says, nope, I won't take anything from you. You're not going to say you made me rich. And so let's zoom out now. Let's make a few observations about what's happening here, especially pertaining to this tithe. This is the first time it happens in this way. And so there's some significance here. So when it comes to the tithe, first thing we have to notice in this passage is the blessing extended by Melchizedek, priest of God most high, precedes the tithe. It's very, very significant, okay? Notice Melchizedek's words in Genesis 14 when he expresses this blessing. He says, blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God most high who delivered your enemies into your hand. What Abram has done is a very big deal. Okay, it's, it's something worth getting excited about, right? Like we've already said, like this is a cool thing. Like, like he's a bad dude. Like he gathers up 315 men. He goes and he takes down this king that nobody else could stand up to. Like it's, 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 it's a serious, exciting, like exhilarating thing. And, and then Melchizedek comes out and he speaks his blessing and he makes it very, very clear the success you've just experienced is because of God. Now, this is not something that takes Abram by surprise. This is something Abram is very aware of. Things have been going pretty well in Abram's life to this point. Okay, we'll, we'll kind of get into that in a moment. Like, like things are going well, but Abram is very, very much aware of the fact that things are going well because his focus is dialed in on the God most high. Abram is faithful. Abram is obedient, and God continues to show up in his life as Abram follows after the Lord. Melchizedek is merely pointing that out. God did what just happened. The success, the excitement, all of that is anchored in the goodness of God. And after hearing this blessing, after receiving this blessing, Abram makes the decision to give Melchizedek, who, who doesn't seem to have a dog in this fight, but has come out and expressed this blessing, 10% of what the Lord has reclaimed, of what the Lord has entrusted to Abram. This is very, very important because what it reminds us is that the tithe in this context is very clearly established as a response and not a trigger. It's a response to God's goodness, not a trigger to initiate God's goodness. The tithe is preceded by the blessing of God's goodness. Okay, second thing I want us to notice in this is the contrast. Okay, you probably notice the contrast, the contrast between the response to these two kings. So it's a contrast from, from a response to a king that promotes and, and initiates generosity and the contrast of a king who, who represents worldly wealth. Sodom was a place that was doing pretty well. They weren't doing, you know, better than anybody. Obviously, Ketelamar had a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of power and a lot of sway in this region, but Sodom was doing relatively well. And so when we're talking about these goods, like the goods that are reclaimed and the goods that Abram brought back, the offer to keep the goods, that was a significant offer. Like that would have been a lot of stuff. But Abram, without even thinking about it, he rejects it. He has just received the blessing from this other king, but he rejects this offer from the king of Sodom. Why is that? Well, well to get a little bit more context, we, we actually have to backtrack a little bit. You, you turn one chapter back, Genesis chapter 13, and, and you begin to get a little insight on this area known as Sodom. You see, uh, like I said, things are going really, really well for Abram. Like, like his, his estate is growing rapidly. Lots of people, lots of livestock, lots of crops. Like things are going really, really well. His nephew is experiencing great success as well. Lot, like his, his estate is growing very, very rapidly. Their estates are very, very close together at this point. And they're both growing rapidly, which naturally results in a little bit of overlap. Now, Abram and Lot, great relationship. Get along, great. It's the people that work for them, specifically the herdsmen, the shepherds, who are watching the flocks in the fields. 
they begin bickering with each other. Why? Because it's hard to keep track of whose is whose because of there's so much overlap. Abram becomes aware of this. He goes to Lot. He says, listen, obviously we get along great. I have no issue with you. You have no issue with me. God is blessing us tremendously, but this bickering makes me a little nervous. I don't want this to bubble over into conflict between our families. And so let's protect our unity by being a little bit more strategic. And ultimately what they decide to do is Abram says, I think, I think I should go one way, you should go on another way. We should spread out a little bit. We have more room for growth. Makes all the sense in the world. He even gives Lot first pick. He's like, you decide which direction you want to go. I'm going to go the opposite direction. And this maintains the unity between us. And so Lot picks first. He picks a direction. He moves in that direction. Just so happens that he settles within the region known as Sodom. Like he's not in the city of Sodom, but he's within Sodom's territory. And there's this little tiny note in Genesis chapter 13 that just makes you aware that the people within the city of Sodom happen to be evil, wicked people who are sinning greatly against the Lord. It's a corrupt culture. And so ultimately, when Abram goes and rescues his nephew Lot, and he comes back after great success and he receives the blessing of this priest of God most high that reminds him that that success is purely because of the Lord and it's because it's trusted in him that God continues to make his path straight going forward. When he comes back from that and the king of Sodom, a, a region, a city known for their corruption comes out and says, hey, I'll cut you a deal. Abram's alarm bells immediately go off. And the deal sounds great. Give me the people and you get all this stuff. But Abram knows that ultimately what this is, is it's an invitation to association. And Abram looks at him very matter of fact and he says, I, I've already committed to God. So God's already been preparing Abram's heart for this moment before it even happened. I've, I've already made a commitment to God. I will not take anything from you because I will not be associated with your corruption you will not have the opportunity to say, you made me rich. God is providing for me. God is making my path straight. And I'm gonna keep my focus solely on God. And so he rejects it. It's heart protection. We talked about that last week, this practice of generosity. It's very much about protecting our hearts, about protecting our minds, about protecting our souls. Proves in Abram's case to be life protection. You flip a few chapters ahead, Genesis 19, things get so bad in Sodom that God destroys the whole city. Now imagine if Abram had associated himself with that. Who knows what would have happened, but he protects himself by protecting his heart, protecting his mind, keeping his focus solely on the Lord. Now, one other thing I want to notice in this passage before we jump to Deuteronomy chapter 14 and get into the command to tithe. There's something very interesting to me. It's something that doesn't get explained at all. This is not a I know situation. This is an I think situation. It's a leap I'm willing to take. I think there is significance to the fact that Melchizedek, priest of God most high, when he comes out to greet Abram, brings bread and wine. The reason I think there's significance, it, it was very, very common back then. This is a very hospitable culture. When you came out to greet someone, you typically brought a meal, some refreshment. Wine was a staple. You almost always brought wine. The food was kind of up in the air. You could bring a variety of things. Some people brought crops. Some people brought bread. Some people brought meat. Like, it, it, different occasions called for different things. I think there's significance to the fact that the Holy Spirit points out that Melchizedek brought bread and wine. Because obviously, you move into the New Testament and you realize the significance of bread bread and wine represents communion, an invitation to draw close to the Lord, an invitation to step into pure and undefiled worship of the Lord, what you and I were created for. Remember last week we said that the beauty of tithing is that it brings glory and honor to the Lord. The more glory and honor you bring to the Lord, more satisfaction you experience in your own life. It's what we were created for, and I think this is an early indication of that. It's an early indication that this practice, this practice that's in concept, we know is tithing, it's always going to be tightly tied to worship. And the reason I feel so confident of that is because you jump to Deuteronomy chapter 14 and that becomes even more clear. It becomes a very, very clear correlation. Deuteronomy 14, like I said, just under 450 years later, a lot's changed for this nation of Israel. Number one, they're a nation now. Like, like they are, in fact, a people, a rapidly growing people. Their growth is so intimidating to the world around them that, that Pharaoh, king of Egypt, has actually made them slaves. God uh, hears their, their cries, God 
shows up and, you know, the fame is uh, let my people go. And Pharaoh says no a whole bunch of times. And then God makes him and, and, you know, uses Moses to lead his people out of Egypt. And then they wander in the wilderness for 40 years. That's where Deuteronomy 14 happens, somewhere in that 40 years. And that 40 years, though it's described as wandering, some very, very intentional things are happening in the wilderness. God is preparing his people. And he's made them this promise that, that ultimately, when, when I determine that the time is right, when I determine that you're ready, I'm going to lead you into a land. And the land becomes very, very significant in the history of God's people. The, the, the land, though tangible, always represented a closeness to God. That was the ultimate invitation. I'm going to invite you to live very, very closely with me, in close proximity to me. I will be your God. You will be my people. And you'll experience the overwhelming blessing that comes from proximity to me on a very, very regular, constant basis. But you have to be prepared for it. And so all this time in the wilderness, it's all about preparing people for this land, who they're called to be and what they're called to do. And so it's just lesson after lesson after lesson, the entire book of Deuteronomy is preparing these people to be there. And at one point in this conversation, the concept of tithing becomes the command to tithe. And I want us to see how how this is articulated. So Deuteronomy chapter 14, starting in verse 22, God says this to his people. Be sure to set aside a tenth, a tithe, of all that your fields produce each year. Eat the tithe of your grain, new wine, olive oil, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks in the presence of the Lord your God at the place he will choose as a dwelling for his name so that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. But if that place is too distant and you have been blessed by the Lord your God and cannot carry your tithe because the place where the Lord will choose to put his name is so far away, then exchange your tithe for silver and and take the silver with you and go to the place that the Lord God will choose. Use the silver to buy whatever you like, cattle, sheep, wine, or other fermented drink, or anything you wish. Then you and your household shall eat there in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice. And do not neglect the Levites living in your towns, for they have no allotment or inheritance of their own. Again, this is an Old Testament passage. There can be some stuff in there that might be confusing. We're going to flesh it out as we go. But again, our goal is three important observations. God now makes the tie, the concept that's been around since since the time of Abraham now makes that concept a command that he establishes for his people. And remember what we said about God's commands last week. If you were with us, we said God gives his people lots and lots of commands. Those commands are never meant to oppress you. Those commands are always designed to maximize life for you. The commands the Lord gives us lead to a better existence. We bring more glory to the Father. His church gets stronger and earth becomes more like heaven when we heed the commands of the Lord. And so let's remember that. So the tithe has now become a command, which ultimately means there is something within this that is very, very good for us. So a few observations we want to make when God establishes the command to tithe. The first is the tithe was expected once a year for God. God's people. Frequency is what I want us to notice. Okay, so why this particular frequency? Why did God's people only give once a year? Because the call to tithe was to give anything their fields had produced. Give 10% of whatever your fields produce. So let's think about those fields for a moment. What, what could they possibly use those fields for? Fields for One of two things, to, to reap a harvest of crops or to raise livestock. That's what people did back then. That's what Israel did in in this time period. They they raised one of two things. They either raised crops, variety of crops. Some of those crops could be used to make things like olive oil, wine, things like that. Or they raised livestock. Most notable livestock were cows, sheep, goats. That's what they raised. There is something unique about crops and this particular type of livestock. They're only available once a year. Crops have a harvest. Happens once a year. Sheep, goats, cattle, they have a calving season that happens once a year. These things would have been reaped once a year. What is God ultimately saying to his people? Every time you get, every time I bless you with a yield from your field, give. Every time you get, respond to me. Here's here's what God is establishing. The tithe is not a bill that's come due. 
The tithe is a mentality that God is inviting his people into. This is a very, very important distinction that the tithe is a mentality and not a bill. And it's a mentality that God wants to grow. Okay, so second thing I want us to notice, there was a particular location the tithe was to be taken to. Okay, it was to be associated with a particular place. And that may be a little confusing as you read this passage in Deuteronomy 14, because he says the place that the Lord chooses and where he'll place his name. Fast forward, and ultimately what God's talking about is the temple. Okay, it was something he would call his people to build. It was something he would call his people to protect. It was something he would call his people to to participate in. This was the center of worship. This is where they went to draw into that proximity to the Lord. It happened at the temple. And so why would he tell them, take your tithe to the temple? Because he wanted to make that clear line of connection between the practice of tithing and worship. He was literally telling them, make this an element of your worship. And this is a very, very important thing for us to know. Why? Because it reminds us the tithe mentality that God wants to grow in us is driven by worship rather than obligation. This is not something we do just because God told us to. That is not true with any of God's commands. God's commands are designed and intended to maximize your life. And so through worship, participating in the tithe as worship, God maximizes our life. We don't do it just because we're supposed to. We do it because we get to, because God is growing something in us. And then at the end of that passage, there's, there's a, a note that probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense to, to us unless we're, we're relatively familiar with the Old Testament. But, but he just notes, remember the Levites in your towns. Now, this, this is actually very, very important because it starts to clarify the purpose of the tithe, what the tithe is ultimately going to be used for, what, what it's going to ensure, what it's going to make possible. The Levites were one of the tribes of Israel. There's, there's ultimately 12 tribes of Israel in the Old Testament. There's, it gets a little confusing at times because then you get half tribes and, you know, you start to do the math and you're like, I get confused. It's okay. There's lots of tribes. And so God, God divides his people into these tribes. It, it all derives from these certain fathers and it it can get complicated at times. But in the wilderness, God really used these tribes to keep the people organized. And as they were gonna move into the promised land, God didn't want us to run into any of those Abram lot situations where there was too much overlap and it ultimately bubbled over into conflict. And so to protect his people, he clarified for each of the tribes where they would be in the promised land so that they'd all have room, so that they could all live in peace and harmony and unity with one another. But one tribe, the Levites, they didn't get any land. And it wasn't because God had forgotten them. It wasn't because God was punishing them. It's because they had a very particular job to do within the promised land. They were a nation of priests. That was their job. Anyone, any male that, that, that came up through the tribe uh, of Levi was to be a priest of the God, Lord most high, just like Melchizedek. And so what were they to focus their time on? It wasn't working in the fields. They, they weren't to raise crops. They weren't to raise livestock. They were to focus their time and energy on maintaining the purity of worship amongst the people. They were to make their business the spiritual health of God's people. And so all that God is saying within this command to tithe is, hey, as you tithe, understand that that, that part of that is I need you to take care of the Levites so that they can do their job. I need you to take care of them so that they can spiritually take care of you. But then God builds on this idea. It's not just the Levites who are going to be taken care of by this. Notice what God goes on to say in verses 28 and 29. At the end of every three years, bring all the tithes of that year's produce and store it in your towns. So don't bring it to the temple. Store it somewhere safe that the Levites, who have no allotment or inheritance of their own, and the foreigners and the fatherless, And the widows who live in your towns may come and eat and be satisfied. And so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. You go back to this time period. Apart from the Levites who had no allotment of land and couldn't provide for themselves, there were some very notable vulnerable populations amongst the people of God. Or foreigners who, who would come in, 
typically escaping persecution, uh, escaping terrible situations like kings like Ketel Lamar, escaping famine. And so they came in to, to find asylum and Israel had been commanded by God to, to embrace such people, but they were coming in with nothing, no, no means of taking care of themselves. There were orphans in their midst, people who had lost their parents, had no means of taking care of themselves. There was widows in their midst. Women did, did not have the, the rights that men had. They did not have the opportunities that men had to provide for themselves. And so a widow was a very, very vulnerable place to be for a woman. And so these are very vulnerable populations. And God says, take care of them. It gives us the, the important reminder, your worship mentality should always have a mission focus. And this is very much in line with with the character and ministry of Jesus Christ. I mean, you work your way through the gospels, you you follow the earthly ministry of Jesus and you categorize everything that he's doing and then you simplify that to, to the least number of categories. You ultimately come up with two categories of what Jesus gave his energy to. First and foremost, it was to protect and maintain the purity of worship to clean it up, to clarify it, to focus it back on pure, undefiled worship, which is wholly focused on the Lord. Jesus fought for that. Jesus protected that. Jesus invested that in everyone that came to follow him, the purity of worship. But right alongside of it, as Jesus went about doing that, he was always looking for key opportunities, and he capitalized on those opportunities to deliver hope to the hopeless. Jesus spent all of his time with the disenfranchised. Jesus spent all of his time with the broken, with the lame, with the blind, with the outcast. Jesus sought out the vulnerable populations and he cared for them. And it's the exact thing he's called his church to, to the purity of worship and to the care for the broken, lost, and vulnerable. So as we've said with this series, we we wanna keep things very, very focused, very, very practical. And so in in, in the larger sense, in in terms of of the origins of the tithe, I wanna be very, very clear on what God established the tithe for. This is where it comes from. The bottom line is simply this. The tithe was never meant to be a rule that you just blindly follow. That was not God's desire for it. It's not to be understood as a rule. It's to be understood as a mentality that God invites us into. A mentality that God leads us into by establishing a practical path of trust and obedience. This is what the tithe really costs you. Your trust, believing God is who he says he is and that he's done what he says he's done and that he'll do what he promises he'll do, believing that and responding with obedience to trust him moving forward. And all of this, all of this is anchored in that purity of worship. It's anchored in that mentality that my whole focus is gonna be on the Lord, that he is good, that he is worthy, And that the more glory I bring to him, the more satisfaction I'm going to find in him. So it's anchored in worship, but all the while it is aimed on a mission. Following God into the work of restoration and redemption that he started on the cross of Jesus Christ. We have been called to be ambassadors of that. So last week, I gave a very, very practical challenge. said, if you're not currently giving in any way, if you're not currently participating in this form of worship, I would challenge you to start and start somewhere. I talked specifically about how the ultimate calling to to give 10% of what you have back to the Lord, that that can be a big jump for some people, can be intimidating. So I want to reiterate, the goal is still to start somewhere, and many of you started somewhere. I got plenty of emails, had plenty of conversations where some people made some changes last week. That's awesome. Like I said, we made budget, we see it, we we saw the response. What I would challenge you to do is, is, is keep going. Determine now how you can be even more intentional. If you began giving something, now take tangible, intentional steps to move towards that 10%, to move towards the full tithe that God calls us to. And as you do that, ensure that you're making this process as intentional as you possibly can. And I'll give you a few pieces of advice straight from Deuteronomy chapter four. Think about the frequency with which you get. Make it regular. Make it regular. 
I said last week, I, I, I'm an online giver. Uh, it's how I prefer to do it. I, I set up recurring giving. I, I like it to come out of my paycheck as soon as I get paid. That way it doesn't touch my greedy little fingers for too long. And so it goes straight to the Lord. Uh, I, I like that not only because it keeps it regular, but that, that's a form of accountability. Oftentimes we're, we're afraid of accountability. You should not be afraid of accountability. Accountability is really, really good for us. We need it. And it's a form of accountability that makes sure that I keep this regular. I have to take some pretty massive steps to go in there and turn that off. That gives God plenty of time to work on my heart before I do that. And so I like to keep it regular. Now, recurring giving can have its drawbacks. It can become very formulaic. It can become a routine. It can become something you don't even think about. And that's why you got to keep the second piece of advice in mind. Make sure you keep this a practice of worship. Okay, how you do it, what you give, when you give, all of those things. Make sure those are all focused on worship. What is happening? (laughs) She didn't give enough. We ran out. (laughs) Cutting us off. Make sure you keep this focused on worship. Okay, so, so whatever means you use to give. We, we have three ways that you can give here. You, you can give in person using boxes in the back of the room. You, you can give online like I do. You can do text to give. Make sure whatever it is that, that you maintain a spirit of worship when you do it. And, and, and again, very, very simple to do that. Carve out the time, carve out the discipline. For me, recurring giving, it happens without my effort, but I get a text reminder that it happened. And so I try to discipline myself when I get that text, stop and acknowledge that it happened. Acknowledge that God has been good. That's why I got a paycheck in the first place. Acknowledge that I trust that God will continue to be good. That's why I can be obedient with this. And align myself with the purposes of God. Okay, God, continue to grow me, continue to stretch me, continue to lead me deeper and deeper into worship of you. And so make sure you tie it to worship. I've seen people putting their gifts in the giving boxes in the back and they'll close their eyes for a moment and it's it's obvious that they're saying a quick prayer. When you send that text, you know, maybe you and your spouse hit the button together, whatever you gotta do to practically make it more like worship. And the last thing, very, very quickly, and then I'll set you guys free. Remember the Levites. Remember the vulnerable. Remember that all of this is because we are on a mission. And my challenge to you would be that, that you become a, as aware and informed on that mission as you possibly can. God is doing some incredible things in our church. Make sure you're aware of those things. There's some very, very simple ways you can do that. Today, it couldn't be simpler. Walk out those doors and stop at the Mohi booth. And I'm not twisting your arm saying you got to sponsor a kid. Lots of you already do. Stop and ask some questions. Stop and and, and read some information. Become more acquainted with our mission partners. Mohi's just one of them. We've got lots of them that are doing incredible things all over the world, all over our country, even across the river in Cincinnati. There's some incredible stuff happening that we get to be a part of. But God is also doing some incredible things in this place that is all possible because of this calling to tie. There, There are incredible campus groups going on. There are incredible home groups going on. There are incredible service projects happening. There's incredible things happening in our kids' ministry, in our student ministry. We've got a fall festival today. There's some really incredible stuff going on here. And ask yourself, am I engaging in the life of this church? Am I becoming a full part of the life of this church? And am I allowing God to sweep me up into the mission that he has called this particular body in this particular area to execute on a daily basis? Because it takes all of us. And so as you go, I want to leave you with those challenges. Consider those things. Let me pray for us and we'll be all done. Father God, I thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you so much for your mercy. Thank you so much for your son. Lord, I thank you for, for the invitation to know you, Lord. We could not do this if you had not first loved us. And so Lord, may we respond to that goodness, to that faithfulness, to that blessing, Lord, by giving our whole lives to you, our wallets and checkbooks and bank accounts included. We love you, Father, and we thank you for Jesus Christ. And it's in, in his name that I pray, amen.